talk about topics that help educate and elevate both men and women. My name is Tammy Palenz, and I'm the president of Veda's Living, an integration manager with Level Heads. And we're talking about how small business needs big HR. My guest today is Jane McCord, and Jane is the principal and strategic HR consultant at Human Capital IQ. Combining over 15 years of hands-on human resources industry experience and keeping abreast of the industry trends and innovation, Jane brings her clients solutions that add value to their businesses both today and tomorrow. Jane's career spans over a multitude of industries and organizations with domestic and international operations. In her corporate roles, she oversaw such functions as benefits, compensation, payroll, leave management, workers' compensation, wellness, HRIS, and mergers and acquisitions. She led total rewards in HR M&A functions at Amtrust Financial Inc., a public global insurance enterprise during the years of exponential growth. The roles she held frequently required rapid examination and decision-making and employing upscaling and and employing upscaling and downscaling strategies to meet business needs. Prior employers include Environmental Defense Fund, Mercer Inc., GCA Services Group, which is now ABM, Amtrust Financial Inc., Cuyahoga County College. She is respected in the industry for her broad scope experience and big picture scalable solutions. Welcome, Jane. How are you today? Thank you, Tammy. I'm doing well. And um, again, thank you for inviting me. Um, glad to be your guest. We have known each other for almost a decade, but we rarely get to sit down and actually um, kind of talk about those big ideas. And HR is not an exception. I think that universally everyone is revisiting um, operations and, and the entire kind of perspective on things. So HR is certainly not an exception. That is so true. And as a small business owner myself, I understand the value, but I, you know, today we're going to unpack what that value is, because I think it's one of those things that as a small business owner, it tends to get overlooked. Do you find that to be the case too? I think so. I think HR, um, IT, finance, um, traditionally were viewed as cost centers. So they're not value add and they're frequently overlooked especially in the companies where management is old school and it's time for companies to really think about this differently so before we kind of get into unpacking more about hr maybe we should clarify what really is hr because i think i think some of us know this right when you own a company or you've worked for a corporation you kind of think you know what hr is but from my understanding with con uh, conversations with you it's so much more involved than what people think Right. Traditionally, HR was viewed as really some straightforward tasks. You hire employees, you need to process some paperwork, you need to provide them with benefits, and, and there are certain regulations and potentially certain company policies that govern HR. But in the modern world, this is not enough. HR is really a system of principles, tools, and values that help optimize organizational performance through utilizing human capital. So, I mean, that's so much broader than what people think about. And it really ties into the health of the organization. And so there, are really, there should be, in probably what many people don't know, some universal healthy principles of having HR. Can you tell us about those principles? So those are really, and, and I know that um, Veda's Living was built on those universal principles as well. So I like to look at this broadly when I talk to um, the clients. I, again, try to provide them with a very broad perspective because it really does apply to all areas of operations and our everyday life. Um, 
if we are intentional and we're curious about relationships, relationship with ourselves, relationship with our um, family and friends, we get a lot more out of it. So uh, the first universal principle of HR is to be intentional and curious about your employees. You really cannot expect to build a healthy relationship if all you've done is you've You've hired them, you process their um, you know, W-4, and you kind of just leave them to be. Um, I have a, a four-year-old daughter, and I know that when I turn the TV on or I hand her a box of crayons, um, this is babysitting. This is not active engagement. And I think that, and it applies universally to small and large employees, you need to be actively engaged with, with employees to get the most efficiency out of the relationship. Um, the second universal principle of HR is to be able to recognize that this is a specialized area. Um, and even we just talked about a few minutes ago that HR evolved significantly over, you know, the past few decades. Um, Business leaders, business owners need to be able to recognize the areas for um, optimization. Um, they really cannot and should not be jacks of all trades. Even within HR, I cannot say that I am equally equipped to uh, provide diversity or inclusion consulting um, or organizational development um, and training because HR has become such a, a specialized area, pretty much like everything else in our world, that you, you really don't want um, plumber to do in a, you know, a colonoscopy. Um, so I think that um, maturity of the business leaders really shows when, when they are able to recognize those areas where um, they're not experts or the areas where they can get um, optimizations through automation. Um, and really no business is too small for this. Um, you may think that if you have a, a 10 employee business that you don't need any HR expertise, you don't need any systems and so on. But um, what happens is all, all those needs are still there. It's just, um, somebody else in the business is either spending time addressing those and probably not addressing them very well and very effectively, or some of those needs just go unaddressed. Um, it's, it's well known, it's, it's well researched that employees um, become underperformers, employees leave organizations really for a, a, a very, um, for a set of very limited reasons. They um, either don't have any internal mobility, so there is no promotion within the organizations. Um, and I looked into it even a little bit further because I was really curious. Um, and according to the um, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, an average number of jobs that American holds throughout um, work span or throughout careers about uh, 15 to 17. And that works out to be um, a new job about every three years or under three years. Um, on the contrary, in, in Europe, for instance, in Germany, um, individuals change jobs um, less frequently than once every six years. So there is definitely something that we're, and not to say I'm not an expert on the you know, European talent management per se, but um, there is something that we're doing here and, and I have worked a lot of corporate jobs. Um, I know that uh, mobility within the organizations, even larger organizations is very limited. So individuals get easily discouraged. Um, the second reason individuals leave or become underperformance, they're not challenged. So it may not necessarily be about the individual wanting to change a title. Um, it may just be about, just like was, we see that with children, if, if they're not challenged, they may be 
um, talented and willing, um, but if they're not challenged, they, they become underperformers very quickly. That completely resonates with me with what you just said, because I read this book recently about diminishers and elevators within organizations. And the book was really interesting because it was talking about when a staff feels supported, when a staff feels challenged, when the culture is good, when they don't have to worry about health care or um, you know, whether they have mobility, when all of those stressors and so many more are taken care of, not just the stressors that are within the organization, but the stressors that are beyond the organization that deal with family and health. When you eliminate those and you support your team, then what happens is you get more than twice performance out of that individual. And it's not just about performance, but it's about showing empathy and caring for your staff. So it completely makes sense of what you're saying by having a good HR, even if you are a small business, it actually will provide a platform for your staff to stay, which a high turnover rate means there's gonna be more expense to the company, but also for them to feel supported and to have that stress relief that they can perform uninhibited while they're there with you. So it seems like companies tend to look at HR as either a commodity, that's an expense, or they look at it a value asset. Now, are there services that, that fall in those categories or is it just a perspective from a small business owner? Um, there's certainly HR tasks that fall in the category of commodities. And those are generally your straightforward, non-arbitrary, regulatory tasks that have to do with new hire paperwork, such as your um, tax elections or I-9, um, payroll processing, um, timesheets. Um, and it actually not, not only it would benefit business owner um, from the time savings and efficiency standpoint, we'll talk a little bit later about the risks um, of not doing this correctly or kind of doing it in the arbitrary way and not necessarily consistently. So that also poses a risk to employees. Um, there is so much technology these days and it's and, and so many companies that offer um, automation of HR services that the prices came down um, years ago and one of one of the best examples I can probably provide is um, within the retirement industry. There used to be um, several large uh, 401k record keepers. And this it used to be a lot more expensive for smaller companies to get kind of on that platform. Um, and those plans used to be a lot more expensive to maintain. Um, these days, because of the automation, technology, again, they really capitalized on non-ambiguity of, of those tasks. Um, now, I actually came across a company where um, you can set up your entire 401k plan online and don't even have to meet with anyone face-to-face. -face. So those processes have been um, streamlined. And because there's so many more offerings, um, the prices came down substantially. You can have uh, the entire HRIS system, which is for those who don't know, this acronym is Human Resources Information System. It's basically a database that will kind of contain and maintain your personal records. So you don't have to um, maintain those records on paper. Um, you'd be surprised there's still so many businesses um, small and medium-sized businesses that still um, do a lot of those things on paper and still maintain paper files. And there are certain regulations that require you to keep those um, files on hand anyway for maybe seven years and you have to start paying for physical storage for those files and so on. And so it really uh, does make sense to take advantage of the technology that, that's out there and that is very affordable. I just want to stress it um, one more time. Now, there are other tasks that are not as straightforward, for instance, professional development and training. Um, 
However, there are platforms, again, that are customizable and affordable in order to set up training programs for employees. You could really purchase um, was a per capita fee, uh, a program where your employees can earn college credit or um, earn a certification. Um, and employees, it, it will benefit your business. It really is at minimal cost. It will benefit your business. It will benefit employees. Um, it will show them that you really care about their professional development. Um, and even if they leave and they take it with them, you, you're still ripping the benefit off of them going through that training and, and developing and not getting bored on the job. And training is really critically important. Uh, you know, another book that comes to mind is The E-Myth Revisited, and it's about, you know, people run systems and systems run businesses right. and the processes within the business. And if you don't train your staff correctly, they're going to be running their own processes, and some of them are inefficient or completely wrong. And I had a client once who who actually um, started tracking the processes that his company was doing, created efficiencies, and then started training by working with a consultant to help him do this. And he, after something like seven years in business, saw a profitability increase of something like 25%. And you would think that when you're in business for seven years, you've already kind of worked out those kinks right. of efficiency. So a 25% increase is really pretty substantial. So there's some obvious reasons why training can be a, a very important part of having an HR program. So, you know, my next question was going to be, you know, you know, what are the benefits for an HR program for a small business? And when we talk about small businesses, like myself, I have a small business, but I'm really the only employee because I'm just, you know, starting a new business at this point. At what point am I going to want to, or other small businesses, start looking at HR services when it's beyond the owner? Um, if you're thinking about growing your business, I think it's not too early to start thinking about HR. And again, it doesn't mean that you have to you know, go and purchase kind of a 360 HR product, but you really want to determine what is important depending on what kinds of employees you're looking to attract and grow what kind of structure and so on. Um, so there's so many facets of HR that it's really difficult to kind of just address without knowing um, the, the plans of the organization. So I always encourage a conversation and it could be myself, it could be another HR consultant, um, and we are all happy to talk to business owners and um, provide them with some insight as to where they should invest their time and resources when it comes to HR. Um, does not mean that they have to, again, do everything at once, but there are certain areas where they will realize more value versus others, other areas. So it's more like a step-by-step -step process. Right. And and, and we know that there are lots of impacts when you don't have a good HR program. We mentioned one of them. And one of the impacts is that there are financial repercussions to not having processes in place. And that ties into HR. What are some of the other things that tie into HR that a business owner can associate with the success of their business or a limited success of their business? So I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, paradox of um, HR for small business. Uh, again, this is more of a kind of old fashioned view of HR that you have a small business, you have small HR needs and you have a big business, all of a sudden you have big HR needs. Um, in fact, it's, it's the opposite. When you are a small business, um, you proportionately, you're relying a lot more heavily on each employee's contribution to your business. Um, the same employee may be uh, is likely facing clients and facing employees and wearing multiple hats. So you can really cannot afford an employee who is not conducting himself professionally um, and is, is not prepared to serve 
service those areas that he or she responsible for. So this is the biggest fallacy probably that I come across when I talk to um, smaller businesses that they're saying, we're just small, we really don't need, we don't need this right now. Um, and, and there's a lot of opportunities that they're missing out on. The second paradox is um, if you look at the most successful, um, the fastest growing, um, the most profitable large corporations, um, they started it kind of in the same place um, and they took off a lot of the technology platforms. They took off, they, they grew. Um, and then at some point of their growth, they realized that they were not engaged with employees, that um, senior leadership really did not know their employees by name. They did not know what their employees breathed and what their employees needed. And for those organizations that want to be smart about it, um, they started looking toward more of the egalitarian um, culture, um, culture of engagement. Um, for instance, um, sharing stock ownership and um, getting um, executives in front of employees, hiring um, the, the chief of staff who would be, or chief marketing officer who is putting those executives in front of the employees to let employees know that um, you know, top management cares about them and so on and, and getting them engaged and putting um, internal you know, promotion systems in place and so on um, and um, all kinds of professional development opportunities. Um, so small employers already have that structure. They are they, a, a business owner knows each employee and can really talk to every employee and, and have a, a better feel of the culture and have more impact on the culture than an executive in a very large corporation. For for those very large corporations, they really need to make it kind of a science effort. Um, um, they need to other professionals to kind of put it together for them. And, and not to say that small business cannot benefit from it, but small business already has this, um, this setup where business owner will generally interact with all employees on a regular basis. Um, those employees are um, expected to wear multiple hats. While in the large organization, a lot of roles are silent. And this is where employees also feel very isolated. They don't get um, a lot of opportunities for cross training or lateral moves or, or upward movement. So again, large organizations have to, you know, put those systems in place and sometimes at the expense of kind of other initiatives. Well, small business owners um, really should be jumping on the opportunities to cross train and to develop their employees. Um, and especially given um, such competitive labor market that we currently have, um, a lot of emphasis, and, and that's true for large organizations as well, they put a lot of emphasis on um, talent acquisition. Um, there's a lot of analytics, there's a lot of external recruiters um, that organizations invest in. They also invest in um, exit interviews and trying to understand and calculate their turnover rates. But unfortunately, the biggest gap is in the middle. We're losing employees who could be perform high performing and growing within the organization. Um, and that is probably the, the saddest part of the entire talent management. Um, I think across the board for both small and large employers that uh, we're underutilizing the resources that we already have at hand. Um, and then we're just looking out the, uh, going out there and looking for a, a perfect candidate 
um, you know, we're sorting through all these resumes and we're hiring external recruiters. Um, we're just looking for that one unicorn who will fit the role and fit the organization. <laughs> and you know what happens a lot of times, and I'm not in talent management, but by been part of organization and kind of top management long enough to see that a lot of times this does not work out. You relocate somebody, um, you know, across the country and that person sounds great and looks great on paper. But um, at the end of the day, you put them in, in this position where they're not being supported. There is no infrastructure. A lot of times, um, there is not really uniform culture that you're looking for the person who will fit something perfectly while there is nothing to fit. And so you expect that person to come in, hit the ground running, and also build that culture. Yeah. And a lot of times it, it doesn't happen. So uh, I think that you know organizations really need to start paying a lot more attention to internal talent development as opposed to um, looking for that unicorn externally. That makes sense. A lot of times the unicorn, it sounds like, is sitting right in front of your eyes. And if you had someone there that could support what their needs are, whether it's challenge them on some of the tasks at hand, um, you know, the opportunity, if the if lateral movement or upward movement isn't there, the opportunity to grow their skill set, which could be applicable to not only their role, but, you know, applicable to the many hats that they wear, if it's a small business or even movement laterally in a medium to larger size business, it's all a plus for the organization. And I think that ties back into my, my prior que question, which is, it, you know, what are the other impacts? And one of the other impacts is that you're looking for talent to solve problems outside of the organization when many times it's sitting right in front of you. And the great thing is then you would be able to retain that talent, um, help them to grow. And if they're a good employee, then that's, that's an asset to the company versus trying to find somebody outside of the organization. And then you bring them in and they have to get acclimated to that culture. Right. Not necessarily really, a win -win. You should really be saving cost and realizing much greater efficiencies if, if you were paying more attention to internal talent development. When it comes to small business, there is another unique uh, piece that I'd like to mention when it comes to talent acquisition. And it's for small businesses, um, customers a lot of times make best employees they're already loyal to your product or your brand. And you've been in wellness and fitness industry for a long time. And I'm sure you would rather see a loyal customer come in as an employee than someone who doesn't care about the industry. Um, and, and I see that over and over. Um, um, we have a, a pediatrician's office that, that my kids go to and I know that you know they source a lot through um, kind of their customers and those are your best advocates they are um, already they already internalized your brand and they are the ones that you can capitalize on and, and trust in helping you grow your business that makes a lot of sense a lot of sense and then you don't have to worry about bringing other people in that you have to train them or teach them or or help them to develop that passion because it's not something sometimes that you can develop. It has to be something that's innate to that individual person. One of the other things that I think about when I think about HR, and I've, we've kind of mentioned this, is culture. Uh, my experience is that Sometimes you think of that HR representative as somebody who's there to manage or put out fires, but really it's more than that. You don't want to look at them as, as having that role. Instead, the resource of being someone that can change culture or maintain a good culture, because I've read that culture sometimes can uh, um, scare people away where they start looking for a company that they feel um, again, supported in that there aren't a lot of stressors, that they have a good team that they're working with, there's good communication. So how does HR play with culture? So it's interesting. Um, you mentioned that people may look for kind of more laid back culture where they're not as stressed. Um, 
And I wanted to share a personal story where um, a, a small business owner, so it was a company of 30 to 35 employees, um, held employees to substantially very high standards. However, she was able to create this culture that I've never seen anywhere else. It was really being intentional and caring and curious. And I'm talking about my first full-time employer out of college. I was finishing my master's in HR management actually 18 years ago. That's how old I am. Um, it, I, I got a job as a, a pension benefit analyst at, um, at DL Scully and Associates. So it was a governmental contractor for a uh, pension benefit guarantee corporation and um, pension is a very highly regulated industry. So there was no slack in there. But, um, and, and at the time I, I was 26. So I didn't really pay a lot of attention to how um, the company was run and HR was run, but you really couldn't help but notice how much thought and effort Darlene put into building the culture. Um, and I was, I worked there for probably only a year and a half. I had to move away for personal reasons. But in that year and a half, um, there were a lot of um, medical situations that came up. There were a lot of babies born. My son was born that year and probably, you know, half a dozen other babies born. There were employees and dependents getting very ill. Um, there were spouses passing and it was a lot for a 30 employee company. Um, Darlene continued investing. She did not take anything away. Um, it, it, she knew that she could not um, provide a, a true pension, defined benefit pension plan to employees. However, her 401k match was 13%. Actually, wow. it wasn't even a match. It was an employer contribution that she made regardless of what employees were contributing. There was a best in schedule attached to that. So you'd have to work for a company for five years or so to get kind of the entire amount. But 13% um, was a lot. And so, as I mentioned, there was a lot, of, there were a lot of medical situations where employees had to miss work. And I can imagine her um, medical increase that year had to be upward 30%. But she didn't take anything away. In fact, she continued giving more and more. She um, got to know every employee. Um, she continued engaging, providing opportunities for professional development. Um, we had, you know, the baby showers and fundraisers and all kinds of things. And employees really felt like one big family. And, and that became my gold standard for a business owner. And I know that it, it, it was a substantial takeaway from her. I mean, this could have been an extra profit that, that she could have pocketed and you know done something was personally, but she felt that it was important to continue investing. So I think a big message to take away for business owners is that you really have to invest and you have to feel that you are sacrificing something. You can't just kind of give a little bit and forget about it. Um, but in exchange, you should expect your employees to, to perform to their best, but you need to invest in them. You need to invest time. You need to invest um, financially and a lot of different aspects, but you really will see return on your investment. And from what I could remember, um, everyone at the company felt gracious and really wanted to perform to their top, top abilities because we saw the, the owner of the company given so much. 
That's a great story. I love that. It goes right back to what we were saying before about diminishers and elevators and the research showing that diminishers in that situation, literally people will give a fraction of, you know, productivity because of being diminished all the time and being fearful of, of performing versus a company where they are really supported. The culture sounded fantastic. Life balance, work-life balance was probably a big part of that, it sounds like, because there was an understanding that things happen in personal lives and that shouldn't impact their work life. I should probably go back and reconnect with her. I haven't talked to her in a few years, but she's retired now. Um, yeah. But I should ask her how she was able to do that. I'm sure there were a lot of difficult decisions that needed to be made because and the certain employee companies, employees wear multiple hats, we really cannot afford having, you know, people out a lot on maternity leaves or on, you know, for, for health reasons. Um, interestingly, it was also the most diverse organization that I have ever encountered. Um, so 18 years ago, uh, and, and I'm not, for political reasons, I'm not going to mention any details in this interview, but um, it was truly a diverse organization. Darlene was um, a, a white female business owner, but individuals who worked for her um, were from, and I'm former from, from Ukraine, and we had individuals of various races and sexual orientations and so on. And, and it was one big family. And, and um, there was no sense of, you know, everyone is super interested in diversity at this point and inclusion, and we have to walk that fine line and we can't say anything and so on. There was nothing like that. It was just a, a genuine desire to help employees so that they help you run your business successfully. And I think the business owners really need to go to those basics of um, being caring, intentional, and curious, just like what we talked about at the beginning, those universal um, principles that apply to everything in our lives. So you did ask me, I know you, you asked me several times, and I want to just reiterate this um, very quickly, the building blocks of HR, or what HR became now, and, and how um, business owners can navigate through all the complexities. Well, there is absolutely information overload when it comes to everything. I mean, you open your phone, uh, we're being bombarded. So I, I don't blame business owners for not understanding where to start and, and why they should care about HR. So I use this, I stole this acronym CPR and if, if that is going to be easy for business owners to remember, then I think maybe this is kind of what their HR framework becomes. And by CPR, I mean, C stands for competition. And we already talked about it. There is um, talent gap. Um, it's very difficult to attract and retain qualified talent. And we really need to invest in that middle chain of talent development. We really need to look beyond what's on someone's resume. Maybe somebody, somebody's a great employee, but maybe nobody helped them with their resume and they're just not a great resume writer. Maybe they're not a great interviewer. Um, there's certainly a lot of diversity in workplace today. There's a lot of assistive technology that allows employees with disabilities to, you know, take the jobs that years ago they would not be able to perform. Um, I remember I came across this invention where um, individuals who are considered legally blind now have this device that allows them to see um, in, in the range of normal vision. And so th those all are kind of life changing and workforce changing type um, um, devices that employers need to be aware of. So they really need to widen their horizons of you know, who is a good fit for, for their all. 
I can't tell you how many employers I see searching, you know, almost on a different planet for somebody who will fit the certain position that they wrote. And they're being so short-sighted as to not to see, you know, they may spend several years. It's not unusual to see the same position being advertised for, for a year or more. You would think that during this time, they should be able to find somebody within the organization and help them grow. Yeah, um, so it's about helping others grow. P stands for productivity. And this is, again, the um, a very um, one of the biggest problems in, with today's workforce um, is low productivity. And that has to do with employees being discouraged, employees not provided um, training, um, not being developed. Um, it also has to do with employees having just the magnitude of other things that they have to worry about, such as being caregivers. And we all learned that this year. Um, so again, in order for employers to uh, be competitive and realize best value when it comes to human capital, um, they need to recognize the competitiveness of labor market. They need to recognize um, productivity issues and provide and create policies, create um, rewards for employees that will boost boss their competitive advantage and employee productivity. And the third piece of CPR is a risk. Um, Again, this is something that uh, small businesses a lot of times don't think about until something bad happens. And I, I don't want to scare anybody, but it is very real. Um, there are regulatory risks out there. Um, there, is a, there is a lot of compliance traps that employers could fall into. Um, start by not gathering, um, you know, correct the, uh, I-9 information or not, uh, not keeping time, um, time sheets and so on. There's just so many compliance traps that employers who um, are not doing something consistently or not doing it with, with an expert can fall into. The second big risk is that discrimination um, suits are on the rise and small employers see that as much as large employers. So those, those risks are very, very real and they can be very expensive. One discrimination claim that simply to get started can easily cost $30,000 in legal fees. And that may be you know, what it would cost you to have half an HR on staff for a whole year. So how can small businesses get started with implementing HR or finding the right resources or the right person for that aspect, especially if they're a small business and they're not looking to hire? In a lot of cases, I believe that if, if a small business is ready to look at um, outsourcing certain HR functions or consolidating certain HR functions, such as under a PO, um, employer will actually realize immediate savings. Um, PEOs have um, substantial purchasing power when it comes to employee benefits. Um, PEOs invest in um, technology. They provide um, employer professional liability insurance that will actually pay those legal fees um, in case of a discrimination suit. Not only that, they provide um, they they inv heavily invest in um, training, and when it comes to training, it's not just about professional development or kind of skill improvement. It's also about mitigating risk, because if you train your employees, your managers, um, how to conduct themselves around individuals who identify with certain minority class and so on, um, you likely are going to avoid that discrimination suit in the first place. 
So there is a lot of layers and it really is um, impossible, um, difficult to kind of just give a, a blanket answer, but there is certainly a lot of value for employers to at least take a look at what they may be missing. For those businesses who just don't have the capacity, don't have interest um, to look at um, any comprehensive at this time, I would say, again, start by getting to know your employees. Um, set time aside to meet with, with each employee, maybe once a year, or twice a year. Um, talk to them what they see from their standpoint if they are um, a cashier or a, a burger flipper or whatever their role is, they are going to provide you with some valuable perspective that you likely just don't have because you are not in that place. At the same time, be curious. Ask those employees what they're looking for what their short-term, long-term goals are, what, um, what you can do for them um, to help them do um, their jobs better. Um, large employers, again, go back to doing those engagement surveys and, and they sometimes, there's just so much analytics around. Um, I mean, Amazon tends to overanalyze everything, but, you really don't need such sophisticated analytics. Again, those universal principles of relationships govern everything. Um, start small, start by, by talking to employees. It does not mean that you um, raise their expectations and they're necessarily going to expect that you start you know, giving out big bonuses or, or, or something like that. Um, you can't do it in such a way that you just show that you care and you're curious, but then you go back and you think about it, you talk to experts and you decide what may make sense um, implementing. Great. So if I hear you right, just to kind of reiterate what we've talked about today, it sounds like the first and foremost thing that you should do is start talking to your employees. They can provide valuable information, valuable perspectives, and it's a relationship that builds upon time and makes an employee feel valued and that's that's the first step so that did it doesn't even right. cost if you any money just a little talking, time if you're not talking to your employees you can't expect them to perform well for you you can't expect um, them to be loyal you can't expect them to come to you at the time they should come to you and tell you there is a problem with your business because if you don't care unfortunately they don't care and that goes for all sizes of organizations I have worked for a large a very large organization that I will not name that um, where that principle unfortunately was just woven in the whole organization and every single employee um, you would ask really just was demotivated and did not care. Yeah, that's very sad. And so the thing is, if you start building relationships with your employees, you can help to prevent that. And gaining those valuable insights can help be, be an asset for the company. And then it sounds like if you're more than one person, then you really want to start looking at some sort of HR resource. You can be an HR resource. There are other resources out there, like you had mentioned, commodity resources that can help some of those. Those automated systems can help alleviate some tasks and time and improve efficiencies. And then, you know, with somebody like yourself who's a consultant, you can really flesh out the needs of the company, provide a great support mechanism so that employees feel valued, so that there are a lot of tasks that are removed off of your plate, because who needs that as a business owner? You have too many other things that are going on. And they're the expert, like you're the expert, you know the stuff inside and out. I, you know, I'm a business owner, I've been a business owner for 20 years. I know very little about HR, just from what I've had to learn over the years. And I know that it's so much more robust than, than my thought process. So, you know, leaving it's it to very the good. It's impossible. It's almost like if you and I started researching, you know, home automation that my husband loves and he knows a lot about it, but <laughs> it's rocket science to me. Um, so HR, again, business owners need to, to just recognize that HR is a specialized area 
it's real. It's not just kind of filing, you know, employee information, created employee files. Yeah. And then once you find that right person and you start implementing these programs, um, then you can sit back and you'll see some positive benefits in a wide variety of areas from um, employee retention to improved skill sets to reduced um, financial expenses, improved productivity, better culture, lots of very good things. Yeah. If you have an employee who is facing clients, um, they will be a lot more motivated um, to kind of push your products and and that's just natural reaction if if there is no incentive to them if there is no um, motivation it's very difficult to kind of keep keep that momentum of them being excited about your product yeah, it's a shared vision. And, you know, you know, one person doing 100% of the work is so much less sufficient, and you can't get very far that way. But if you have 100 people or five people or however many people, and you all have the same vision, but you share the workload, and you support each other, then the company is going to be successful, and your mission is going to be accomplished. So you, I mean, every time we have a conversation about this, I, I thought we've got to get on here and teach other people about the value. And I'm sure that others are going to want to reach out to you. So how, how can our viewers contact you? What are the best ways? Um, they can find me on LinkedIn. I'm not hiding. Um, Jane McCord, um, Human Capital IQ. Um, and they can contact me either on LinkedIn or um, connect with me and contact me by, by phone or email. I'm happy to talk to um, anyone answer some simple questions, provide direction. I won't charge for, for that. I'm really curious and learning what businesses are doing, what they're struggling with. So this is not simply kind of money making for me. I'm really at that point where um, I, I want to understand what is holding businesses back, what, what makes some businesses successful, successful and what's holding others back. That's wonderful. And I, I know the Veda's Living community of women will be happy to hear that you're willing to sit down with all those business owners and, and do a consultation. So we'll make sure that we post that on the blog. I'll post your LinkedIn information and your company information uh, below so this video so people can get a hold of you. Thank you so much to you for to giving your time today and your expertise so people can understand HR better. And thank you to all the viewers for stopping by today to check out our video and learn more how they can grow and support their business and, the, and their employees. Don't forget to follow us on Veda's Living YouTube channel and our social media sites and namaste. Have a good day. Namaste. Thank you.